Hello. Hi, it's Kendall. Can you hear me? Hey, Kendall. This is Henry Gremion. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I, I'm just uh, just on and want to get my program put on. You say I go Great. to go down to share. Did you say? Yep. Share and then click on your PowerPoint screen. Okay. And then click share again. And let's see. Share, share again. Let's see if it comes up. <laughs> yeah, we see your uh, internet browser right now. Okay, so if I just go to this, then. There we are. Um, and you, so we can see the speaker view right now. Um, oh, let's so see. Can I, let me see if I can. Play. Yeah. Let's see if I can get off of the speaker view. Why would it do that? Didn't do that the other day. Um, if you go back to PowerPoint. Mm-hmm. There's a way to do it. Yeah, if you open your presentation again. Okay, I, I, my presentation's open. Oh, um, we just see your internet browser right now. Okay, let me. So you see my various presentations? Is that what you see now? No, we still see the internet window. Do you want to stop your share and then reshare it so we can try again? Okay. I'm not sure what Let's try that. Okay. So now I'm not seeing anything here. Let's see. Let me go. Um, I'm going to hit new share. I'll stop the share. Okay. I stopped your sharing so you can try again. Okay. Hello. Hello, it's Kendall. Okay, you uh, Hello, Lauren Miss Collie here. Hi Lori, it's Kathy Kendall. Liverman. Thanks. Oh. oh, hi, Kathy. Hi. Glad you're on. Sounds sounds good. A good connection. Good. Great. I think we're we're trying right now to do the share. Just test out the share with a couple of the speakers. So. Okay. Thank you. Kendall, did you do you see mine now or? This is Henry Gremion. No, I stopped your share. So if you reshare the PowerPoint, we can try again. All right. Let me reshare. Okay, so we see your browser window. So if you want to try to open PowerPoint. It is open. Um Okay. I think in that. I guess yeah. yeah. We see your presentation in um with the speaker. Just like on the bottom. Yeah, that little screen. What isn't that the one? Yeah. No. That's a different one. Thank you. 
yeah, that's it. Yeah, click that. Perfect. That looks good for us. That looks Got great. It. Thank sorry, you. Sorry, sorry, it took me a little time. No, you're good. Thank you. Hello, this office. Uh, Hello. Uh, yes, I thought I was joining the meeting. Oh, okay. Hold on, please. I think we might have a. Yeah, that's awesome. If you're getting an incoming call, probably won't. Yeah, won't work through that. Did any Did any of the other speakers want to try out um, the web sharing? Or are we okay? I, think I would love to, Laurie McCauley. Okay, Laurie, that'd be great. Hey, Laurie, this is Henry. Oh. Hey, Henry. How are you? I'm good. Good. Great. Be fun. Good. So what do we need to, uh, um, Kendall, you just need to give Laurie the right um, to share. Yeah. yeah, Laurie, you can do it now. You can share how we did you see the note from Seal Feldman that she's having trouble with the sound? Oh, no, it's not. Uh, okay, I will. Do you see my screen now? Yep. Yeah. I'll just I'll email her, thanks. Is she, she's on the, Olivia, can you see that connection? I am working right now. Cool. Dr. Feldman, can you hear us? We have most of our speakers on. That looks good, Lori. So, that looks good, perfect, Lori. You, okay, I'll, I will stop sharing then. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Great. Any, everyone else okay? Um, Dr. Feldman, let us know if you're having any issues. Um, I think we're going to try in the messenger. Hey, what's the meeting Connect. password? Is there one? Oh, me ID. Okay. Wait, this is not the right I can I can forward her the information again. Her phone number? Um,
haven't gotten anything from her yet. No. Um, sure, I can. I am emailing her. Yeah, but um, should I ask her what number is best? Yeah, first of all. We can invite her by phone. Um, okay. Okay. Set that up. Got it. Uh, hi, this is Seal. Oh, hi. We're delighted to. This is Kathy Liverman. Delighted that you connected. Thank you. Yeah, it turns out my phone died. Oh, no. <laughs> Those kind of things always seem to happen at these times. That's yeah. great. Well, welcome to everybody who's joined us so far. We're going to wait another couple of minutes to get started, but thank you so much. Thank you. It's a Zoom meeting, huh? Okay. Uh, yes, we have you you were there for the morning. Yeah. We're unmuted. Okay. <laughs> Hi, this is Kathy Liverman at the National Academies. Um we're gonna get started in about another minute or so. So just thank you for joining us and we'll connect your soon. So I thought that the the last time that they did one. In a second. Kathy, this is Dave Copenhaver. Quick question: Are we uh, going on camera, or is it smattering of just phone call and then those presenting slides? No, we were. Um, this is Kathy. No, we weren't going to use um, cameras. We're going to have either slides up or just a still slide. Um, so it'll just. We won't be using cameras. We'll probably turn everybody's cameras off. That'd be great. Thank you. So, so I guess we might as well start. Um, so again, this is Kathy Liverman from the National Academies. I want to thank you for joining us for this webinar today and um, special thanks to our speakers. Um, 
And I want to turn it over to our committee chair, Kata Bond, who will do the introductions and get us started here. Thank you. Can you unmute, make sure she's unmuted? Sorry, I'm trying. Welcome everybody to this public information gathering session. Uh, this session is meant to inform the work of the committee and it's open on the record information gathering session. Uh, the objective of this webinar is to receive a variety of perspectives from dental and medical educators about professional education research and specialization related to TMD. The webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted on the project website. No formal report of this webinar will be prepared. As part of the National Academy's process, the committee collects information and material to consider and discuss as it makes its findings, conclusions, and recommendations. So I ask everybody to be mindful of the fact that we haven't made any conclusions yet. Um, and that comments made by individuals, including members of the committee, shouldn't be interpreted as positions of the committee of the National Academies. Today's discussion supplements other information gathering activities of the committee, including the March workshop, which I hope many of you attended, the June webinar, the committee's ongoing analysis of the literature and committee members' own experience in this area, among others. As our time is limited and this is an information gathering activity for the committee, only members of the committee can ask questions to speakers. But we welcome written comments always and you, you, these can be sent to tmdstudy at nas.edu. So before going any further, I'd like to introduce committee member Dr. Bob Wyant, who is Associate Professor for Public Health and Professor and Chair of the Department of Dental Public Health and the University of Pittsburgh School of Dental Medicine. I will turn this over to Dr. Wynett to introduce the speakers and moderate discussions with the committee. Thanks, Bob, for taking this on. Thank you, Kata. Uh, so the format for the webinar is two panels of speakers, and we've asked the speakers to each limit their presentation to five to eight minutes to keep within the time frame of the webinar. Um, I'll be keeping time, so if you're at risk of going over, I'll gently remind you. Um, after each speaker, we will pause for clarifying questions. If there's something that, that really didn't make sense and you need some clarification, mm -hmm. if you have time. But um, after the first three speakers, after the first panel, we'll take a longer pause and we can engage into a more in-depth discussion with that committee. To maximize our time, I'll provide some introductions that the full bio sketches of all of our speakers are on the committee's website. So starting with panel one, um, let me introduce our three speakers on panel one. Our first speaker uh, for this panel will be Dr. Lori McCauley, who is the William K. and Mary Ann Najar Professor and Dean of the School of Dentistry at the University of Michigan. The second speaker will be Dr. Cecile Feldman, who is the Dean of the School of Dental Medicine at Rutgers University. Our third speaker will be Dr. Henry Gramillion, who is the Dean at Louisiana State University School of Dentistry. Welcome to you all, and uh, the floor is yours, Dr. McCauley. Okay, I am sharing my screen. I hope you can see that now. Thank you, Dr. Wyant and colleagues for this invitation. I was asked to focus on two main questions, that is on interprofessional education and TMD education and training. What you can see in this first slide is that Not quite there uh, and in Sorry. particular for- Hang on one second, Lori. We need to get the presentation sorted. You want us to just put them up? Now we have it. So I'm sharing my screen. We can see it now. Okay. 
I sh can go ahead. Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, the first slide, I think you can see that um, for TMD and in fact for our overall DDS curriculum is highly integrated such that uh, when our students learn about craniofacial anatomy, they're also learning about clinical cases that link to the anatomy. And when they're learning uh, clinical radiography, for instance, they're also learning muscle physiology. So in fact, TMD and pain education is throughout our curriculum. The next slide is our focus of interprofessional education at Michigan. We've had uh, IPE opportunities for many years, but uh, a formal center in interprofessional education for the last four years. And over that time, the number of offerings has grown from five to over 33 offerings, including courses and modules and simulations. There's seven health science schools that are involved in our IPE education. Uh, that's nursing, medicine, dentistry, social work, pharmacy, public health, and kinesiology. And really central to this and a driver in our IPE activities are our faculty champions. And so education in, uh, for faculty specifically directed at how to be successful at educating across the professions is really critical. I was asked to address what are the drivers for interprofessional education. So um, I really, uh, that dictates sharing that the Commission on Dental Accreditation, which is the accrediting body for schools of dentistry, includes a CODA standard on interprofessional education, which you can see on this slide. Our graduates must be competent in communicating and importantly collaborating with other members of the healthcare team. You can see a list uh, at the lower right of uh, other healthcare providers that uh, is part of accreditation we're asked to specifically discuss how our students uh, interact with these other healthcare professionals. I was asked to share what ideas uh, to increase and incentivize interprofessional education, and um, I list them here really just across the board, bolstering uh, the concepts of IPE and interprofessional collaboration across disciplines, identifying exemplars and highlighting them. Really key, I think, is providing faculty development opportunities, expanding GME support, and number five, which is not on there, but um, I think we could do much, much better integrating electronic health records across um, our professions. Relative to education and training on TMD, I was asked to discuss the nature extent at our institution. It covers air, all aspects of our education. Um, I show a graph here. This is from a publication that was done at University of Washington. It just highlights the percentage of total curricular hours across uh, this variety of health professions. This is at the University of Washington, but you can see the dental curriculum has a large percent of its uh, curriculum covering pain topics. In fact, we, um, I just reviewed this in our school, and we are about 15% of our didactic curriculum that covers uh, pain topics. Um, I'm going to just run through our um, highlights of our curriculum that do contain pain topics. This is our first year curriculum, and I would highlight the musculoskeletal system, which you can see on this slide. This is just an example of a, a slide one of our students would see by Jeff Gerstner, who covers much of this, and he highlights the differences that uh, muscle fiber types have in this uh, temporomandibular region. And I also highlight here that um, all our education, including TMD, uh, is evidence-based, frequently citing uh, the literature. In the second year of dental school, again, several different courses, but uh, two in particular, the oral facial complex three, which will cover much of the neurophysiology and occlusion fundamentals. In the third year, we have advanced clinical head and neck anatomy. There's a pathways program that runs throughout three of the four years, and this is where students can have individualized education, and many of their uh, selected topics include oral facial pain. We have clinical rotations in hospital dentistry and also uh, interprofessional education, a team-based clinical decision-making course. 
In the fourth year, I would highlight that our students all do a clinical rotation in hospital dentistry, where they benefit from working with Larry Ashman, who runs a, a CODA-accredited oral facial pain program, having over 1,000 cases per year, and uh, 54 of them, which are operating room cases. Uh, this is an example of the preclinic that carries into the clinical education. I'll run very briefly through this clinical exam form, which you could look at later. But in addition to a complete medical history, patient demographics, a comprehensive occlusal evaluation, including static and functional analyses, a comprehensive muscle evaluation, including palpation and pain location, and then uh, finishing with an in-depth intraoral examination. Um, if our students have uh, an opportunity to see patients in our clinics, both uh, at the hospital and in our school. And when they have patients, they're directed to educational resources from the NIDCR and the American Academy of Oral Facial Pain. And I'll just finish with what are your thoughts on what needs to be done to improve TMD education and training? Well, I think um, we could do better at bolstering graduate programs across the country in oral facial uh, pain. I think better financial reimbursement for uh, TMD patients would help our ability to better educate our students. Uh, more clinical experiences and assessment and treatment of TMD continually developing contemporary basic sciences that do this uh, really uh, fine integration of critical thinking and clinical integration, robust research programs, including genetics and uh, data science, and uh, will help us to increase our evidence base in our educational opportunities as well as the implementation and investigation of emerging technologies in the TMD uh, and pain areas. And with that, I will stop. That's great. Thank you very much, Dr. McCollum. Um, is there, are there anybody uh, from the committee who has a, a relevant, important question at this point? Yeah, this is Francesca. Um, thank you, Dr. McCauley. That was an excellent overview. Can you just, um, with the graduate medical, with the graduate programs, the, can you give an example of what you mean by bolstering graduate programs? Uh, so um, we have an accredited oral facial pain program uh, that runs through our hospital dental program. And so when I say bolster, I think we could, have more of those programs across the U.S. I'm not sure, but I think there may be 13 of those programs, which then is obviously limiting to geographic areas. So I think increasing those programs would uh, be a huge benefit because they really support our ability for students to partner with residents uh, in, in their learning experiences. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, with that, we'll move on to Dr. Feldman's presentation. So I'm just trying to bring, bring my uh, slides up. We can see your desktop and you can see this the PowerPoint. There we go, I think I'm getting it now. Yep. Got it. Yep. Good, okay. All right, well, thank you very much. I very much appreciate the opportunity to, um, to give some um, thoughts um, on this topic. Um, first, I'd like to just start with a disclaimer um, that I am not a TMD expert. I'm a general dentist by training. Um, I've completed a PGY-1 and did a rotation through a TMD service, and I know just enough to know that I don't know anything about TMD. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's, an, it's an area that... Um, um, we need to, to figure out what's the right role for a general dentist in there versus what needs to um, be um, referred to individuals that have more um, advanced training. Um, the other thing just to note is that while I've served on the, the um, CODA um, commission, I currently serve as a consultant. I'm not speaking on behalf of the commission. Um, the same thing, I've served on the Council for Dental Education and Licensure, which at one point had responsibility for recommending dental specialties. Again, I'm not speaking on their behalf. 
I'm speaking purely as an individual, and the opinions are purely uh, my own. Um, I thought it would be good to take a, a step back um, to just uh, get a better understanding with regard to the educational um, pathways, both the dentistry in general and then with regard to TM, um, TMD. For those that are not familiar, um, dentistry is a four-year program post-baccalaureate, um, and after you finish the DMD or DDS program, you can then get additional training either through continuing education programs, through what I'll call fellowship programs, and then through accredited uh, postgraduate um, um, programs. Continuing education programs I'm defining as those that are a day to a couple of days or a couple of weekends in length. Fellowship, which is a term that we use here at New Jersey but is not universally um, accepted, is what I would consider to be an extended continuing education program that would last anywhere from six months to one year in length, and then anything um, past that is, is an official postgraduate um, um, program. All right. It's also, I think, important to understand the difference between the DMD and the MD curriculum in that on the physician side, um, once you do your MD degree, you have to go on to do a residency, and MDs, when they graduate um, medical school, they are not ready to practice independently. On the dental side of the house, the individuals have to be ready to practice independently, and it means that our curriculum is extremely condensed. Um, our students are in class generally 8 to 5 every single day or in clinic 8 to 5 every single day, five days a week, almost year-round. Uh, and so the curriculum is almost at a limit where you can't just keep saying, we're going to add more to the curriculum and we're going to expect our students to, you know, to learn more. Something needs to, uh, needs to go or there needs to be additional time that's required in order for somebody to go into independent um, practice. The other thing to note is that dentistry um, is probably the most expensive program in higher education. Um, it's due to the fact that most of dental schools run their own clinical enterprises. The dental schools have to cover the cost for them. Reimbursement for care is extremely low. We work um, a lot with low-income um, individuals. We are a safety net um, for, the, um, for, the, for the nation. Um, and as a result, our students end up having to subsidize some of that care through that tuition um, that we need to charge. And on average, our students are graduating with about $300,000 worth of debt. Um, residency programs or postgraduate programs, only some of them are GME supported. So for many programs, students have to pay tuition or they don't get a stipend. Um, and if they are GME supported, it requires contracts with hospitals. Dental schools cannot be eligible for GME um, alone. It has to be through, um, through a hospital. Uh, so let's move now to um, what we do here at um, Rutgers. Um, within our DMD program, um, we do have um, curriculum that's scattered throughout, um, covering the basic clinical, epidemiological, and um, behavioral science aspects um, of that. I think Lori gave an outstanding um, overview as to um, what's in a um, DMD cur um, curriculum. Um, here at Rutgers, we do not have a required clinical rotation for our students to go through the oral facial pain service that we have here. Um, we have plenty of patients for our postgraduate program, but it would be insufficient for us to expose every single one of our students to a, a, a range um, of cases to get a meaningful um, experience. We do offer it through an elective or selective. Um, it's something that we have aspirations to do um, in the future, but we need to deal with issues with regard to finances and a few other um, aspects um, of it. Um, we have a very active continuing education program um, that's been in existence for probably over 40 years. We offer both in-person and online versions um, of that. Uh, we have a oral facial pain fellowship program, and we also have a accredited um, oral facial pain program that is two um, years in length. Um, nationally, by the way, there are about 12 programs that I believe that are accredited at this point um, in time. All right. From a continuing education um, standpoint, um, it is in pretty high demand, these, these um, programs. Um, as I said, Rutgers has been involved for over 40 years. Um, our program, which started 40 years ago as a CE program, kind of moved towards a fellowship um, and now is towards an accredited program, though we still retain um, different programs so that we cover that entire, um, entire spectrum. Um, our online program is mainly international. Um, there's a huge um, interest in it um, internationally, uh, but it wouldn't prevent anyone from, from the U.S. to register um, for it. But many of the U.S. Um, students appropriately are interested in hands-on um, opportunities to actually work um, with patients. Um, and do believe that this area is extremely ripe, ripe for interprofessional um, programs. 
Um, one of the challenges is that each health professional has a different accrediting group for continuing education so that it would be recognized by their um, state board. So logistically, um, it can be a little bit difficult. Um, universities or academic medical centers are probably um, ideal to offer interprofessional continuing education programs in oral facial pain or TMD uh, because we oftentimes have that infrastructure to be able to offer um, continuing education programs across the different health, um, health professions. Um, a word about interprofessional um, education. Um, again, it is, it, the TMD model is an incredible opportunity for this to, to, um, to occur. Um, centralized structure for IPE is extremely important. Um, if not, oftentimes you'll see certain health professional schools not getting too, um, too involved. Um, you often find, by the way, that dentistry is in the lead of these programs because we don't seem to be um, as scary to folks. You know, we're not necessarily positioning with the physicians, for example, as to what our scope of practice should, um, 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 should be. And so dentistry oftentimes is, is able to take that lead. I know here at Rutgers we've got a, a, a major HRSA um, grant. It's about a $2 million um, grant to lead an IPE initiative um, here um, at the university. Um, and if you talk to a lot of universities that are actively involved in EPA, IPE, scheduling is oftentimes the nightmare, trying to get all the students um, together at one period of time or even doing it through rotations could be extremely, um, extremely difficult. Um, most, if not all, health professional programs require um, IPE, and that has certainly helped it along. Um, but knowledge of TMD is not just limited to dentists. It needs to be across um, multiple health um, professionals. And so, again, this is an incredible opportunity for both IPE, but also for intradisciplinary education within dentistry because the TMD cases oftentimes involve multiple dental um, specialties. Um, a word about accreditation. Um, Lori showed you one of our competency um, um, standards. Um, there are about 29 curriculum competency standards that have about 75 subparts, um, and that includes patient assessment and diagnosis. Um, we are trying to get away as a profession in dentistry, um, we're trying to get away from listing every possible diagnosis or every single possible treatment as being something that's listed separately in our competency statements. Um, we do have statements right now with regard to pain, uh, um, pain control. Um, competency requires um, achievement where individuals are able to uh, both diagnose and treat those conditions without um, outside um, assistance from the standpoint of being able to demonstrate to our faculty that they're able to perform um, without having um, um, assistance. And that's not realistic in all areas. And I would say in the TMD area, it is a very complicated um, area. And what we don't want to do is have um, lots of people out there that theoretically are trained in TMD, but when patients go to see them, they really don't have the, the expertise and the experience to treat those, those, those cases. And so I think being able to define that baseline in which um, our practitioners have to be able to know it's, it's something involving the TMD um, and they know the right people to refer it to, that that's the best thing that we can do for our patients. If not, patients end up spending a lot of time with practitioners who aren't able to deal with the situations um, at hand, and then there's unnecessary suffering that goes along, uh, go along with, with that. Um, so I think we need to be very deliberate. I think we need to differentiate between what we want our students to be familiar with and know how to refer versus what they should be treating themselves. Um, it means that we need to um, be able to make sure our students um, understand how to do lifelong learning and that they know how to, to analyze the evidence, but they're also really good at assessing what they can um, treat and what should be referred, um, be referred out. Um, and so the recommendations that I would have is that, one, we consider um, laying out a recommended curriculum and a consensus um, across what I'll call dental education so that we know that when somebody is a general dentist, we know um, what level of knowledge they have in this particular um, um, area. Um, I think that we need to consider moving towards a required PGY-1 because I think in a PGY-1 experience, I think, I think that we can then provide um, uh, these dental residents a more in-depth experience where they then can really handle um, some of these, um, these cases. Um, GME, um, being able to ob obtain funding for these dental residency programs, I think is a conversation for another, um, another day. Um, Let's see, I think that uh, the ability to leverage um, interprofessional education um, standards is something that we do want to, to move forward with. Um, I think developing some high 
level cases that uh, maybe we can use the MedEd portal to be able to um, distribute them, um, that these cases developed both for pre-doctoral education and for postgraduate level and even for CE, I think could be extremely um, helpful. And I think that for the accreditation standards that we just don't want to add TMD to the list, rather we want to focus on the underlying um, um, skills. So those are just some of the thoughts that I um, have about um, TMD education. Thank you, Dr. Feldman. Uh, do we have any uh, questions from the committee? All right, then it's time to move on to Dr. Gamalian. Um, and uh, we'll have his slides up in one sec. Are the slides up at this point? No, they're not. Not just yet. Okay. Well, while we're waiting, I, I want to thank you and the committee for um, having us on here. I, I know all three of the deans on this first segment this afternoon appreciate the opportunity to share what we feel is a very important scope of information, and so a broad breadth, if you will, of what we, we'll share this afternoon, and I know it'll build hopefully nicely on what was uh, presented in the first webinar in June. Right. Thank you. Your your slide now available. Okay. Well, you know, as as we look at, at where we are, we know that certainly uh, pain in in the United States is uh, is really occurring in epidemic proportions. Uh, it's important for us to recognize that nearly 20 percent of the general population has orofacial pain disorder that's severe enough to have special diagnostic and treatment needs, as been uh, discussed previously. Uh, a significant number of those uh, have to do with the masturbatory system or stomatonathic system, as we see, uh, which would be classified either as a direct temporomandibular disorder or a contributing factor, such as the oromotor um, disorders, which of which sleep-related bruxism or parafunction would be included. Uh, we were asked to talk about educational experiences. I'd like to just have a brief review of where we, we've been because we haven't come that far in, in truth. If we look at what was discussed in 73, survey of uh, community physicians and dentists published in the Journal of American Dental Association by Green et al., uh, the conclusions were that most teaching was very fragmented. Major component of occlusal courses uh, was where TMD or TM joint dysfunction, as it was called at the time, was housed. It's a minor component of behavioral courses, and there were a few separate courses. From that time forward, there's been a plethora of conferences uh, or other types of meetings focusing on TMD and orofacial pain and the need to expand the horizons with regard to undergraduate and postgraduate education in the field and now interprofessional interprofessional education. It was stated back in 1990 that the requirement of competence in diagnosing TMD is pervasive. I think Dr. Feldman just made an excellent point. Competence is, a, is a, a, we have to use the word carefully if we're going to talk about specific diagnoses, but exposure uh, to a degree of being able to triage and refer is, is certainly a very important aspect of the undergraduate education. And I think that we have to recognize that the occurrence, the incidence and prevalence of temporomandibular disorders is such that we have to move forward. That move forward, though, has come along very slowly because back in 1992, American Association of Dental Schools uh, suggested predoctoral curriculum guidelines in temporomandibular disorders and orofacial pain. Unfortunately, uh, that has not come to pass. And where we are with regard to education and orofacial pain is somewhat disjointed at this point. We've made some headway, and I think it's testimony to that headway of the programs, postgraduate programs that have started. However, as we look at where we are, um, the accreditation uh, standards for advanced education or uh, programs in orofacial pain was established back in 2009-2010 uh, with a very uh, rigid uh, group of, of standards for those programs. And they've come full, full circle in that there has been a, 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 a development of 12 and possibly now 13 programs around the United States, but certainly not near enough programs to educate uh, the individuals who uh, I think are necessary to care for this, this large uh, population, uh, recognize that the temporomandibular 
disorder health care cost in the United States today is $4 billion, certainly highlighting evidence-based treatment needs for this population. Uh, as we look at the undergraduate or pre-doctoral guidelines, uh, in 2013, uh, the, the word temporomandibular disorders uh, was removed, and, and I understand the rationale and, and concur with that. However, my question is, do we have cause for concern? Because at this point, we have this need for more postgraduate programs without adequate exposure, not suggesting competence, but exposure to a point of appreciating uh, the complexity of the situation and understanding of who should be referred and who could be cared for uh, in uh, the general dental practice setting, I think, uh, is, is not well defined. So I have some questions that require answers for all of us to po play a role in answering. And that is, uh, what if a scientifically based protocol for all patient assessment could be provided to all dental professionals, one that was standard, standardized and evidence-based? A more complete and accurate diagnostic process could be determined. More predictable treatment outcomes could be achieved, and a mechanism for standardized data collection for clinical research be established. Now, we've made good headway in many of those areas, but most importantly, a validated educational model could be implemented at different levels, recognizing the vari variation in complexity required for that education. The orofacial pain ex educational experiences does have some significant and I think important desirable qualities using some of the buzzwords today. Uh, how can we best prepare future ready oral health care professionals? We're doing it more in a multi interdisciplinary and interprofessional and intraprofessional manner and didactic and clinical exposure uh, be provided, which is evidence based. Uh, potential for research be furthered and outcomes-based reporting be required. Uh, the vision for the future, and this has been mentioned, and I think we share some very common thoughts in this area, um, undergraduate uh, accreditation standards include at least something beyond just pain control, which in many, many schools is local anesthetic and, and just the basics of pain control. How can we include some of these other areas for exposure that are somewhat better spelled out? Additional postgraduate accredited programs, I couldn't agree more uh, with uh, both previous speakers as the need for that is so great. Uh, continuing education that's evidence-based, in-service training that is interprofessional and intraprofessional, enhanced public awareness, and a regional centers of excellence be identified. We are, I think, at a, 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 a looking at a horizon, as has been said by uh, Dr. Peter Dawson, today's dentist must be a physician of the mastery system. I would offer the proviso and beyond. And, and there is no better area for us to look at this complex uh, uh, tapestry, if you will, of diagnosis and management of pain in the head and neck than one that would be facilitated any better by interprofessional education and collaborative care. Uh, as we look at a collaborative approach to develop healthcare students, and future interprofessional team members, uh, is, as has been suggested by the Institute of Health. I do as well think that temporomandibular disorders and orofacial pain and dental sleep medicine offer ideal constructs for interprofessional education, and most importantly, and where the rubber meets the road, is the care of the patients in need, interprofessional collaborative care, utilizing a multi pronged program to educate oral health professionals, other healthcare professionals, CODA, consumers, <coughs> and third parties about the importance of the team approach in managing patients with acute, recurrent, or chronic orofacial pain. Uh, I feel like that we can, we need to expand our educational offerings we at both in the, in the professional as well as in the public sector. And that therein lies, and is something that was mentioned earlier, nobody's touched on at this point, the need for consideration of specialization and education of third parties, which was talked about in the previous webinar, uh, so that third party payment systems will recognize that the temporomandibular joint and the mastery system is truly part of the overall well being of the patient. And without being able to properly masticate, 
uh, our foodstuffs, there's going to be some illnesses and other uh, disease processes that will be facilitated. Uh, some of the things that we have done here at LSU uh, with our interprofessional education has been to partner with the School of Pharmacy from Xavier University uh, as our students interacted in clinical settings, recognizing that pharmacotherapeutics is a significant component of the necessary tools to have in the chest to manage TMD and orofacial pain, uh, allowing these individuals to have a better appreciation for what one another does. Uh, another area that we have implemented here, and we've done this on a couple of occasions uh, uh, over a two-year basis, is where we bring our teams together, uh, teams of, of, of uh, physical therapy students, nursing students, et cetera, in our six schools uh, in an interprofessional experience uh, for uh, regarding temporomandibular disorders, where we have an expert panel that, that presents and where the students interact on case-specific assessment, diagnosis, and development of treatment plans between uh, the various healthcare disciplines that are involved. Carrying on to what's necessary and we're, we're doing at the continuing education level is a series of courses that are delivered in an inter and intra-professional manner uh, going from uh, working with physical therapists, oral surgeons, as well as pulmonologists, our sleep physicians, clinical health psychologists, um, as well as neurologists in this series of courses that build on one another uh, throughout uh, the continuum. So as I think about where we're going and, and where, uh, where we've been, uh, I do think that if we look at the big picture and why I'm so excited about this, this webinar and the focus of this webinar is that if we ask the question, how many dentists does it take to take the, to shape the future? It's really not just dentists, it's oral healthcare professionals and healthcare professionals in general, because it'll take all of us individually, collectively, keeping in, uh, pa the patient's needs foremost and maintaining a clinician scientist perspective. So with that, I know we'll have some uh, very lively discussion, but there is need for elevating the status of the importance or the status of temporomandibular disorder diagnosis and management uh, at all levels in multiple healthcare fields. So I thank you for your attention and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Gramillion, and thank you to Drs. Feldman and McCauley. Uh, I think you've collectively provided us with a nice overview of what's happening in dental schools and what some of the challenges are. And um, I think it's, it's, it's a good news, bad news situation. I think we're, we're clearly focused on the issue and the need, but maybe uh, we're lacking in some of the uh, curriculum uh, content from an evidence-based perspective and some of the time in the curriculum to adequately address it. Uh, I know it's always a challenge with dental curricula to, to increase anything. It's a zero-sum game in general. And um, so uh, we are at the point in on our uh, agenda where we have time now for broader questions from the committee. So let me open that up now to the committee uh, for questions, comments, and discussion in general. So Bob, this is Kata. Uh, I'd like to ask our deans, um, we heard about for-profit uh, continuing medical education programs that uh, really uh, seem to, at least it, from what I heard, um, actually be uh, providing training to larger numbers than our dental schools are. And I wonder if that's true, if there's any um, knowledge of what's the ratio of the number of people taking uh, continuing education programs related to TMD at uh, dental schools versus for-profit systems that may not be as evidence-based as we'd like to see. Love any comments in that area. Uh, this, this is Henry Gremion. Um, I think your last part of your statement was the most important. I, I think that there is a lot more continuing dental education taking place uh, in the out, outside the dental school sector uh, with regard to these for-profit um, hotel or weekend uh, CEs that are taking place. 
problem is that there's no control and the evidence-based component, as you mentioned, is lacking. So it, it's a two-edged sword. I do think it's our responsibility as we think about education, not just of the dental students, but of our graduates um, and others to, uh, to provide that evidence-based learning platform on which a, a real scientific base for decision-making and practices can occur. But that's not, that's not pervasive now. I would say that the bulk of continuing education is by for-profit or uh, self-grandizement purposes. I could say that, um, I mean, the focus, at least within, within Rutgers, is for those continuing education programs that are extended in length. Um, and, you know, we try to instill in our students as they're getting ready to graduate that they need to be really careful with regard to where they seek their continuing ed you know, education. And, you know, a weekend course in something really is not what prepares them to actually um, really understand a, an area and be able to um, really um, gather and understand the evidence and to be able to do the best, you know, by their, their patients. Um, in the space that we're in, in these extended programs, there's probably less of the for-profit involvement, um, that's probably more with the shorter term kinds, you know, kinds of courses. Thank you. Yeah, and this is Lori McCauley. Um, I can't comment on the for-profit CME, but I would just um, highlight what I mentioned in my presentation that uh, the percent of curriculum on pain topics is much higher in dentistry than it is, for instance, in nursing, medicine, and pharmacy. Um, and and so I think that's an important thing to center on. And, and I agree. We also, as uh, Cecile mentioned, we try and educate our students on where to seek CE, but what to seek out of their CE, that it uh, really should be evidence-based and strongly grounded. Um, so it, there, there is some discernment there as well. Hello, this is um, Francesca Duomena again. Thank you all for really excellent uh, presentations. So uh, both, uh, especially doctors uh, Feldman and Gremion, um, really alluded to the notion of exposure versus competency, and indicated that at least in current uh, in the current educational um, um, paradigm, we're focusing on uh, training um, the dental students to be able to recognize and then refer. Um, but your comments about um, the continuing education programs and, you know, others that have sort of come across the work of the committee makes me wonder who they're going to refer to and, um, I, I, you know, it, who, but how should those people that they're being referred to train? So can you comment about, um, you know, taking the patient's perspective, um, who their um, well-trained dentists are going to refer them to. If, if I could, um, this is Henry. I think that's, that really heralds uh, or elevates the need for these postgraduate programs that are accredited by CODA with a very stringent accreditation process uh, to be increased. And by, by doing that, will enhance the number of educators in the future who will be better able and equipped uh, to provide that enhanced exposure for our undergraduate students. Uh, I think that that also will set a stage where we'll raise a standard across the nation with regard to the overall evidence-based services available because of the nature of these postgraduate programs and should help to elevate the status of the uh, fact that the temperament mandibular joint is a vital uh, synovial joint in the human body that should be treated like other synovial joints about the body, hopefully enhancing third-party payer and potentially uh, specialty status for the field. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think that one of the challenges right now is is how to for the public, right? How to find out who is truly trained in this area. 
Um, using the state of New Jersey just as an, as an example, right? So the the Dental Association has a website that you can go and you can look up um, specialists, but um, TMD is not recognized as a specialty area. So there's no resource where a patient can go to find uh, to find you know individuals who are really trained in that area. And I think that that's critically important that that resource be be available. I mean, the worst thing that a patient could do is is be forced to go from one person to another, from one professional to another, all who really are not well trained in you know in this area, um, because then you're never able to get the a correct diagnosis and really you know get to the the issue that's at at hand. Um, and so, anything that could facilitate um, the ability to get that kind of information, I think, would be really really helpful. I agree with Dr. Feldman. You know, when I was in the program at, and directing the program at the University of Florida. Uh, for those 17 years, what we found was that the average patient that we saw for the first time in our uh, tertiary care center, um, secondary and tertiary care center, uh, had suffered from their pain uh, uh, on average uh, almost uh, five years. And th that, uh, that person had seen an average of six different healthcare professionals seeking relief for that uh, respite from the pain and spent on average out of pocket $17,500 chasing relief for that pain, but you still hadn't had relief. So I do think we have to have a better mechanism by which individuals who have that background can be identified by both uh, practitioners and other healthcare professionals, uh, as well as the general public. So this is David Deeds. Um, uh, I'm trying to figure out how best to ask this question, but several of you have alluded to it. I, I was interested in the comment that the, the debt is approximately $300,000 for the average um, dental graduate. And um, a, a PGY one year was mentioned uh, to add education and training, which it seems to me is likely to perhaps increase that debt. Um, I'm interested if you have any thoughts Somehow it seems to me that, that one of the components of this is that there has to be some incentivization for a practicing dentist to, to spend the time to adequately become educated, to, to make a correct diagnosis, to spend the time with the patient. And, uh, as, and, and this is a problem in allopathic medicine as well, that these types of so-called cognitive services are not particularly well reimbursed compared to uh, procedural services. And so I don't necessarily expect any of you to have a solution to this problem because I certainly don't, but I'm interested in your thoughts. Well, I mean, I, the, 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 I mean, dentists really do want to do right by the, by their patients, right? And, um, this issue of not compensating for cognitive time or cognitive services is a very significant, is a very significant one. Um, you know, I think that there, there does need to be a relooking as to how we do, you know, our reimbursement for, um, you know, for, for dentists. And um, we also need to, to, to look at an artificial, you know, division between if certain services are provided by one type of healthcare professional, it can be reimbursed, but if it's done by another kind of health professional, it can't be re reimbursed. Um, and, and and so I think it's it's a it's a it's a much larger um, problem, um, but at some point we need to start thinking about how we would re reimagine um, that we that we that we reimburse for for care um, based upon the care that's actually delivered and not be so hung up on whether or not it's an MD or DMD or a nurse practitioner or somebody else. Yeah, and I think you heard really all of us highlight the need for better financial reimbursement and some of the complexity around that uh, being the healthcare provider, but it could also be that we need better evidence base in the therapies that we're providing. And that speaks to what uh, Dr. Gramellian uh, talked about as well as clear outcomes of care that can be utilized in that regard as well. Uh, this is Bob. Let me just um, sort of pick up on that. I, 
I teach evidence-based practice and I, and I look at the literature and TMD and it seems there's far from consensus on, on optimal treatment approaches. And I'm curious just to anybody on the panel, if you feel that if we went to any of those 12 uh, programs, graduate programs, if we would find a consistency across those programs of what they're teaching, and if you were to seek treatment from a graduate of those programs, would it be the same regardless of which program they graduated from, or is there still this sort of confusion around what is optimal care and it's more philosophical than evidence-based, how people approach them? Well, this is Henry, and I, I would suggest having and, and knowing uh, most of those programs as I do, uh, that the vast majority, while there might be some slight physical, philosophical differences in certain areas or choice of pharmacotherapeutic approaches, uh, et cetera, I think that those programs would be much more standardized than what you're reading about or, or perceiving from the literature uh, because of the, the standardization brought forth to a degree, not, not from a standpoint of being um, dictatorial, but through the, the CODA accreditation process. And, uh, and because of organizations like the American Academy of Orofacial Pain, which have taken a strong interest in involvement and involvement from a standpoint of evidence-based perspective. That's, I think that's important, that's good news. Um, I guess the next question then that follows is we're sort of implying this two-tiered approach that the general practicing dentist uh, is the person who may need to be competent at screening and, and deciding when a, an individual should be referred, but knowing who they should be referred, the patient should be referred to is the next step in that process. And if there is some sort of consensus that folks from these programs are the, are the right ones to do that, um, is there some process we can do to educate our general practitioners so they understand that not everybody is going to be as equally uh, trained and effective in, in treating and managing, and that you know you should there should be a credential behind the person you're referring to that suggests that they're well trained. Is that something that we think about or can can start to work toward? Well, we are somewhat working in that direction. While we are not at specialty status yet. Um, uh, there is uh, the status that is provided by completing these programs and going through uh, this, uh, this postgraduate uh, exam process, which includes a written assessment as well as a uh, oral examination, as much specialty as many specialties already do. And this is supported by uh, the, uh, the program through the American Academy of Facial Pain. So what, what's happened with that is there's a network of private practitioners who have gone through and achieved that level or status uh, that has been brought forth uh, by uh, those individuals who have gone through the formal training program process. I do think, too, that our continuing education programs, uh, and it's been my experience both at Florida and here at LSU, and I've seen it at the uh, two other schools represented here, the continuing education process has become uh, one that provides us another opportunity to educate those individuals coming through our programs uh, as to uh, proper referral and who that referral network is. Uh, I can't tell you how many times a week I get called as to uh, suggested referral in an area of the country, uh, and <clears throat> it's always going to be someone who I know practices along the lines of the way that we have shared with our residents through the years. Um, and Henry or um, any of our other deans, um, given the extent of the problem uh, with TMD, what, what, what is your sense of how much or to what extent the program should be extended? So are we talking about doubling the number of um, programs? Um, what, and do you have a sense of how much that would cost? That would be speculation on my part, but I think when you look at the um, the degree of or the number of pain, the prevalence and incidence of pain in the head and neck region in the United States, the doubling the number of programs probably still wouldn't meet the need uh, because you have a small group of uh, residents coming through those programs. It would take years to to uh, get to the level of penetration 
of those postgraduate trained people out there um, to meet the need, but it's a start. Yeah, and I think you'd also want to look at where they are in their in their regional uh, absolutely as that well. Was one of the reasons in increasing. Yes, I'm sorry. That was one of the reasons I I, I mentioned and and went over very quickly. Um, the identifying regional centers of excellence um, in the field. I know that's kind of a trite term, uh, but it would be centers that would base their diagnosis and practice approaches uh, on the evidence-based principles that have been established. Uh, Bob Wine here again. Is there is the treatment approaches that are taught in these centers um, something that only a dentist can deliver or, or are they approaches that are, you know, sort of more um, interdisciplinary in nature um, and, and would it be sensible to have, you know, a combined program of some sort? Well, I think it, this is Lori McCall. I think this is an opportunity for interprofessional or collaborative care. Um, I know our program has strong ties to uh, several other healthcare providers, although um, I think they might benefit from better co-localization um, in the program, which is not the case, but they do have a strong referring referring network in their own, in our own health system. But yeah, I think the, the, these advanced programs are the perfect place to optimize an inner professional care program. Yeah, I mean, I agree with, uh, with Lori. The, 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 I mean, I know that the, the program at Rutgers, we work very, very closely with uh, neurology, with physical therapy and, and with others. And so, our residents spend time in those services. Their residents spend time in our, you know, in our um, service. And um, these, these cases are just multidisciplinary by, na by nature. I agree. My, my um, time at the University of Florida where I directed the orofacial pain uh, residency program and, and the center, uh, we work daily with clinical psychology and, and, and physical therapy and pharmaco, uh, pharmacotherapy or, or pharmacology, and we were closely allied with neurology, ENT, and all the other disciplines uh, mentioned. So I think, though, Laurie hit, uh, uh, Dr. McCauley hit, hit it right on the uh, nail, nail right on the head, is that co-location, and then uh, if we have a center of excellence, co-location co offers so much advantage if the opportunity exists to create that, because you're under one roof, communication is enhanced, and a greater deal of direct interprofessional interaction takes place. And ultimately, and I think the data would suggest that the patient benefits. Um, the more you talk about this, the more I think um, of interdisciplinary pain uh, centers. Of so my question is, um, why, why wouldn't uh, TMD be part of the interdisciplinary? If we're, if we're moving towards an interdisciplinary approach to education, why isolate TMD? Why not just include them with all the other um, pain syndromes? <laughs> I, from a standpoint of... Sorry, of, I didn't mean to stump all of you. <laughs> no, no, no. From a standpoint of my belief system, it should be. Uh, I think TMD has too, too, too long been put out uh, to the side like it's in another pasture rather than the same field. Pain is pain, and orofacial pain can be some of the most disabling pain that exists, uh, not just speaking of TMD, but some of the comorbid conditions that occur. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm a firm advocate of it being within the confines of a broader scope pain diagnosis and management area. Yeah, I mean, I think it yeah. raises the, the question as to um, how much, you know, TMD is integrated into some of the other um, um, healthcare pain curricula. Um, you know, oftentimes anything that's related to the mouth is kind of just automatically shoot over to the, you know, to the, to the dentist. Um, and, you know, other healthcare professionals don't want to deal with anything that's associated with the mouth, off, you know, off, oftentimes. And so I think that this as, a, as an area is, a, is, a, is ripe for um, better integration into those other health, 
professional programs. Yeah, I, I totally agree as well. And I think um, Dr. Gramillion, when he uh, had his presentation highlighted, and I also agree that TMD, sleep medicine, or two areas that are really well suited for a collaborative care approach. The third, I think, are craniofacial anomalies. But in my mind, those three areas are the ones that are, are most critical suited for collaborative care. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask uh, that we wrap this session up and move on to our second panel. Uh, thank you all for panel one speakers. I appreciate your very insightful presentations. And we will now move to panel two. Uh, our first speaker for this panel is Dr. Jeff Schaefer, who is Assistant Professor of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery and direct, the Director of the Oral Facial Pain Clinic at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. Following that will be Dr. David Copenhaver, uh, who's a board-certified anesthesiologist and pain medicine specialist and directs the Cancer Pain Management and Supportive Care Program at the University of California, Davis. Is directing the pain telehealth program. And then our third speaker will be Dr. Christopher Fox, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the American Association for Dental Research and the International Association for Dental Research. So, uh, Dr. Schaefer, you can lead us off once we get your slides sorted here. We're good to go. He's on. He's not muted. Dr. Schaefer, you there? Uh, we're not hearing you if you are. Possibly on mute. It does look like he's on. The mute button's down on the lower left, if that's the issue. Maybe come try to Yeah. Oh, so we're trying to connect with Dr. Schaefer. This is Kathy. Um, so maybe okay. we'll move to the next speaker and then we'll come back. Is that okay? Okay. That'd be great. Uh, can we put up Dr. Copenhaver's slides then? He doesn't have any slides, so we'll yeah. go right. ahead and um, turn it over to him. Very good. Dr. Copenhaver. Perfect. Thank you very much. I, I, it's really encouraging to hear this kind of a progression of discussion. It's fascinating to hear um, the differences in our different professions. And it, I'm, I'm a, um, a faculty member at UC Davis. I run the pain division. We have a relatively large footprint in the university. Uh, the University of California has six different locations uh, as medical centers. Um, and I'll try to mention a little bit about the experience from the University of California as it comes to this topic. Um, the first question was it with respect to interprofessional whether it be intra, inter, or transprofessional education, what are the drivers? And in trying to be uh, poignant and give the salient aspects of what could be the drivers and trying to be concise, I would largely say that one of the difficulties that we've talked about is just pain curricula in general being implemented into allopathic medical school curricula. Um, what's the driver for interprofessional education? I would say largely in the end, it's outcomes, um, you know, the bulk of the medical. Hello. Uh, this, this is Dr. Schaefer. I, I just unmuted me. That's right. Uh, we're, we've moved on to Dr. Yep. Copenhaver now. We'll come back to you when he's finished, okay? That's great. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah. thanks. And this will dovetail nicely with the idea that um, outcomes that really will focus on, on 
what drives, I think, the education. I'll give you our experience in terms of where I see the bulk of the experience that you gave it. We don't have an oral maxillofacial department, nor do we have a, a dental school at UC Davis. But we do see a substantial amount of these cases, um, in addition to the fact that in the cancer center, with certain types of head and neck dissection, we'll end up seeing um, TMD disorders um, and atypical facial pain. So value-based care is really what we, you know, in the current scenario where the engine has somewhat stalled on CMS's ability to kind of uh, forward value-based care. It's really the advancing care coordination through um, episodic payment models. And I'm sure many of you are familiar um, with this strategy. It really comes under the MACRA, the Medicare uh, CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015. It's the push to understand that many of these patients uh, when they come through the emergency room, and I think um, Dr. Feldman pointed out the, the point that if they're seen by multiple providers uh, that don't have um, expert knowledge or at least uh, diagnostic capability to make the diagnosis, um, in these cases, they become high resource utilizers. So we see that the push to understand um, improved outcome starts with that the medical industrial complex, largely we treat acute episodic uh, care, we're good at that. We, in terms of chronic illness management, um, uh, we have a lot of room to, to work on, on being better at treating uh, chronic illness and in cases like this. So um, mm -hmm. education really might improve uh, when we look at how we look at benchmarks. So I think Dr. Gamillion mentioned standardization or even going to the degree of competencies. Um, certainly would be key. We focused on looking at benchmarks for chronic pain and for different thematic archetypal chronic pain conditions. And we've been working with different managed Medicaid programs. Um, these are large programs that might ensure a million lives, 600,000 lives that are interested in tackling pain care, but looking at what benchmarks should they focus on as the payer? And then how could we teach to those benchmarks as academics? largely looking at this as you could think of it as a pay for performance program you could think of it from a number of different strategies of, of alternative payment models for chronic pain and i think that's probably where interprofessional education um, works best we've looked at this and we do teleeducation for primary care providers for pain essentially i spend a substantial part of my time working myself out of a job because there isn't like dr vermillion mentioned enough pain specialists or other providers that are focused in this field to really treat um, uh, everyone, one, and, and then we have the current workforce that we need to educate. So te broad tele-education programs that really dovetail on CME may be a solution, and we're enacting that here in California. Um, participation in those types of programs can be used as leverage for certain providers that become more educated about, for example, in this case, TMD or pain in general, uh, to work within their health system. So for example, Kaiser, uh, if in the Kaiser uh, organization, if you partake in these types of uh, certificate programs, the thought is they can't necessarily hire um, uh, any number of psychiatrists or pain specialists or oral maxillofacial pain specialists, but they can certainly incentivize individuals to perform in a certificate program and then augment their salary as they learn more education. So it's really providing that in a tele-education kind of a space. We can talk more about tele-mentoring if there's questions. Um, so I think it, what drives interprofessional education is largely outcomes and then what drives that is largely the finance, um, unfortunately. Um, Education and training on TMD in, in our uh, institution, unfortunately, I would say this, this really embeds the idea of pain education and the huge gap that we found ourselves in. And the opioid crisis, you could argue in many different ways, sure there was liberal prescribing practices and um, responsible opioid prescribing was problematic, um, but it stems from largely this education gap. So we performed with a large group who looked at, was hosted through UC Davis, um, a broad look at the unit, US medical licensing exam. 
it's actually only the second time that uh, a review of the medical licensing exam as far as a educational intellectual pursuit had taken place. Uh, the first article that actually was found on this was like in 1997, and it was a review of the USMLE to really compare part one to part two, 86, 1986, part one to 1993's part two. And it was just looking at the USMLE exam. Uh, what we did is we looked at um, the USMLE and how does it represent, this is the test that uh, pre-licensure medical students take to become licensed in the United States. And this exam, actually what we found was uh, uh, somewhat shocking is that we expected not to see pain anywhere on the exam. We expected this to be the, the linchpin to understand the opioid crisis. Although what we found was pain was present and all over the exam, in fact, about 15% of the exam, um, it really was left to just be the assessment of pain. And there was very little understanding of context and certainly very little in terms of breadth and scope of what is the pain experience. This kind of fits with the graduating medical residents that, you know, we looked at a survey and about 2,600 medical residents completing training in a variety of specialties where pain is really essential, 50% only felt somewhat prepared uh, to counsel patients and about 25% felt really unprepared. So in the 1,500 questions scored on the USMLE, pain showed up in about 70% of these question in, in the questions, but the vast majority of these was largely just assessment. And there was really little in the backdrop of understanding uh, the broader context of, of pain management. I would tell you that that article that was published in pain medicine, really looking at the USMLE and, and pain, it really came at the heels of a prior paper that was uh, accomplished uh, um, through a consortium at UC Davis was looking at the pain core competencies. And it was really in a thrust in 2013 to develop the competencies in pain management. And I know what you might be thinking, it's, it's odd that uh, pain competencies hadn't been addressed previously, but to, prior to 2013, there really hadn't been broad interprofessional pain competencies developed. So it really tells you where we are in allopathic medicine to include even TMD when pain management, uh, at least in its broad scope, hadn't been included in, in medical school curricula. That said, it, in the University of California, we have a broad UC opioid coalition. We're trying to collate the six campuses together around understanding pain education and how to incorporate that into medical school curricula. And it largely dovetails on utilizing the competencies that were published in pain medicine. Um, specializations, when we look at how do we, the fourth question, when looking at what are the needs, benefits, and challenges of implementing specialized oral facial pain, we've tried to tackle this here at UC Davis with really, it is a interprofessional kind of cross kind of collaborative effort with including uh, ENT or head and neck and otolaryngology, neurosurgery. I have a joint appointment, for example, in neurosurgery, neurology, and then advanced pain medicine skill sets to try to um, collate a referral process so that we can work as a unit. It largely is the challenge of breaking down silos that are pretty fixed uh, secondarily to fee-for-service uh, care. Uh, so I would say that Incorporating dentistry and oral maxillofacial surgery would be key, and I'm excited to hear Dr. Schaefer's discussion as we don't have that particular specialty at UC Davis. Um, what have we done? We've focused on unique efforts of looking at TMD and uh, really tried to partner with the community. So that's really the transprofessional component uh, to looking at TMD, and we could certainly talk more about that. Um, Continuing education. So what role should academia play in, in continuing to educate physicians, nurses, and dentists? We found that the best way to make change uh, and synergize change, the, the, you know, change agents is largely through web-based platforms and remote education through uh, telementoring. And we focused on that throughout rural California and even the urban underserved areas of California to teach pain management uh, to large groups, focusing on federally qualified health centers 
and manage Medicaid products as well as manage Medicare products. So many of you may have heard of the extension of community healthcare outcomes forwarded by Sanjeev Aurora at the University of New Mexico, really leveraging uh, the web platform much like this to educate many in rural New Mexico about hepatology. Largely this would take place with pain management or pain education and TMD would fit uh, a large portion of that um, oral maxillofacial content. So ECHO or other versions of, of telementoring, web-based education can be key. And I think that Really, this is a new horizon at constructing um, a curricula that can be then presented by way of web-based platforms. And much of this can be done uh, through the university setting and then coalescing this throughout the state. So New Mexico is able to accomplish this through the state legislature uh, for uh, pain, and, and they were able to do that um, and receive funding from CMS. And similarly, we're on the quest here in California. Um, yeah. I'm gonna to have to cut in. We're, we're just running a little long and I wanna to get to the other speakers so that we can. Absolutely, no, that's, that's where I, I conclude. So thank you. Excellent, <laughs> perfect. Um, so I guess we'll move back with Dr. Schaefer at this stage. Um, do we have- so I'm here. Can yes. you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear great. you great. We'll just uh, take a second to get the slides up and then we'll, uh, we'll get rolling. So I wasn't able to get onto um, Zoom myself with, the, with my computer, so I'm just gonna be on the cell phone and I'll tell you when to advance the slides. That's great. Sounds good. Does that work? Yeah. Good to go. Great. So I, I was asked to talk specifically about specialty recognition and what the state of uh, that is for the, the discipline of oral facial pain. And I was gonna talk about the problem, you know, what uh, specialty recognition can possibly so address. Um, you know, I'm gonna discuss a little bit about what TMD is and compare that to oral facial pain. And uh, then I wanna talk about the process of ADA specialty recognition. And then I'll discuss what the role of, or where oral facial pain um, stands in that process for ADA um, special recognition. So you wanna advance the slide, please? So the problem really is just lack of access to care for patients suffering from chronic oral facial pain disorders. And I think uh, all of us that work in the field, you know, my books are out probably 14 months now. It's really hard to manage the, the patients that are seeking care. Um, to describe the problem in more detail, um, 10, if you advance the next slide, please. So it says access to care for chronic oral facial pain disorders. Um, uh, at the top of the slide, 10 million people with chronic oral facial pain go without care each year. And that's from the AOP uh, organization. Um, and then if you, I have a um, custom animation here. So if you can advance it again, the next statement, one in six patients have visited a general dentist, um, reported oral facial pain when they visited that dentist within the past year. So, you know, 20% 20, 20 of patients. Um, four out of 10 of those patients, when we talk about how um, many people with TMD or oral facial pain will, will regress to the mean and get better on their own, you know, 40% of these patients still have pain five years later. Um, and then it can be um, quite compensating for that page, those patients. So, you know, how do we address that? We, when we talk about TMD, you know, and there's, if you advance to the next slide, um, you can see a depiction of myofascial pain or sore muscles and the referrals that, that they can provide. Those X's represent uh, pain referrals to teeth and, and other places like ear pain. And also there's a picture of a slip disc and a TMJ. And we want to be able to, um, part of the problem is just TMD disorders. And we want to think about uh, myofascial problems, um, mastery muscle pain, TMJ arthralgia, but also neuropathic pain. And uh, this is one of the things we try to teach at our dental school. We want our students to be able to diagnose whether someone has a TMD problem what kind of pain it is, whether it's muscle or joint, and also do they have a neuropathic component or a chronic pain presentation in that musculoskeletal injury. And if you compare that to oral facial pain, if you can, next slide please, and it says oral facial pain is state of the art at the top of the slide, and there's a list of different uh, disorders that come into the field or, or make up the, the um, 
the problem of oral facial pain. And you can see it has intracranial disorders, primary headache disorders like migraine and cluster, secondary headache disorders. And if you just hit again and you can see the next um, custom animation that shows what secondary headache disorders make up. It's temporal arteritis, post-traumatic headache, medication overuse headaches are examples of second, secondary headache disorders. You have neuropathic pain. And if you uh, custom animate again, go forward, that involves episodic trigeminal neuralgia type pain uh, or constant, maybe sympathetically maintained type pain. Um, there are intraoral pain disorders. Um, there's TMDs, and that's, as I mentioned before, involves TMJ as well as mastectomy muscle pain. There's cervical pain disorders. Um, associated structures, if you custom animate forward again, um, involve extracranial disorders. Um, uh, involving uh, ear, nose, and throat problems, uh, sinus problems, or salivary problems. And lastly, you, know, you had to think about access to disorders, which involve mental disorders. So it's a pretty broad discipline. There's lots of things in there, and it's not easy to diagnose these patients. Um, so in summary, uh, the access to care problem involves uh, oral facial pain that involves neuropathic, musculoskeletal, vascular, autodontogenic, granular, glandular and intracranial etiologies. And, you know, how do these people get care or do they get care? Um, if you advance again, it shows that 95% of dentists report a preference to refer these patients to oral facial pain specialists. So most dentists just aren't comfortable in managing these patients. And they recognize their um, being unprepared to manage these patients appropriately. 32% uh, of dentists stated that the reason they first such patients is because of low reimbursement by insurance agencies. So that's something we have to work on. And I think uh, specialty recognition will help that. So uh, advance to the next slide, please. Um, and the top of the slide says specialty recognition would expand insurance coverage, uh, referral networks, and improve care because of that coverage. So I think it'll encourage people to treat these patients um, and also, um, you know, establishing a certain expertise or scope of care for oral facial pain is very important. So um, I think that's critical. So let's talk a little bit about what the ADA is doing. Um, the ADA for many, many years had never recognized a new specialty. And uh, they did recognize uh, dental radiology about uh, uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, and in 2017, if you should be looking at the slide that says ADA, American Dental Association, on top of it. Um, they proposed a new ADA agency to recognize dental specialties and certifying boards. And this is separate from the ADA, but it's a specific agency to do that. And as you, many of you know, um, they just recently recognized um, the an dental anesthesiology as, as a new specialty. Um, the requirements for a specialty uh, from the ADA's perspective is it should be represented by a sponsoring organization. The membership of that organization should be reflective of the specialty, and there has to be a separate certifying board that recognizes an expertise in that specialty. Next slide. Um, the slide says specialty board. Each board should, qual should certify qualified dentists as diplomats. And um, the next custom innovation forward. Uh, no more than one board should be recognized for the certification of diplomats. So it uh, has to be one board for that specialty. Uh, next slide, please. Um, they also have to have formal advanced education programs to train dentists in that specialty or providers in that specialty. It should be at least two years. It has to be accredited by the Commission on Dental Accreditation, and it has to be able to provide special knowledge and skills required for the practice of that specialty. Next slide. Um, so just talking about where the um, ADA recognition for oral facial pain is right now, uh, in 2000, uh, the AOP presented the first application for special recognition to the ADA, and that was 19 years ago. In the meantime, the AOP had developed written and oral specialty examination to establish diplomat status in the oral facial pain. That's the American Board of Oral Facial Pain, which is a wonderful board. A lot of work has gone into that. It's recognized in the medical community as being a um, really meeting the standards or setting the standards for, for uh, the development of a board to measure an expertise in a specialty. So we're very proud of that, or should be very proud of that. And then also the ADA developed uh, code of accreditation standards uh, for a two-year residency. And that's been just, that was the first developed about six years ago when we just last year um, reviewed those, those standards and approved uh, updated standards. And uh, in 
As of 2016, 12 oral facial pain, pain programs had achieved code accreditation, and more, more are on their way. And there's probably maybe 30 residents a year that are trained uh, that are come out of these programs. So not enough for sure. Next slide, please. So uh, in order to promote special recognition, and because the ADA was um, not moving forward with special recognition, um, the American Board of Dental Specialties was created. And that involved uh, implantology, uh, dental anesthesia, oral medicine, and uh, lastly, oral facial pain. And so, you know, the, uh, there were some lawsuits. Uh, the ADA was, was sued in the states of Florida and Texas. This was a, a couple years ago uh, in the favor of, uh, you know, in stating that they, the local dental board shouldn't be able to um, be the, be the uh, agency that decides whether a, a discipline is especially or not. And they lost those, those lawsuits. And in 2018, um, there were dental boards in Minnesota, North Carolina, and Ohio that recognized uh, oral facial pain as a specialty. And there's other applications going on now in, in various states. And um, in the meantime, the ADA uh, last year decided to establish that agency that they had proposed. And so there's now a new agency that recognizes dental specialties in the certifying board. And that's the board that just uh, recognized uh, dental anesthesia. And so next slide, and it shows the ADA American Dental Association just summarizing that, that proposed new agency. And then uh, just to summarize what the ADA um, recognition uh, thoughts are, um, it's the association, the ADA's association belief that the needs of the public are best served if the profession is oriented primarily to general practice, and that's general dental practice. And that specialties are recognized in those areas where advanced knowledge and skills are essential to maintain or restore oral health. Next slide. Um, so specialty recognition involves a proposed specialty must be distinct and well-defined field which requires unique knowledge and skills beyond those commonly possessed by dental school graduates. Next slide. Um, so the scope of this advanced knowledge and skills should be that should be separate and distinct from knowledge and skills that are required to practice in any recognized dental specialty and cannot be accommodated through minimal modification of a, of a recognized dental specialty. So that brings us to the American Academy of Oral Facial Pain, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Uh, this is a little bit of an older slide. There's at least about 650 uh, to 700 members now uh, in the American so, uh, um, group um, and with many more members uh, internationally. And 75% of these uh, members are private practitioners in the management of oral facial pain, with about 25% educators based in universities and teaching hospitals. Um, so that's the last slide, and um, the, uh, the American Academy of Oral Facial Pain has submitted an application to the ADA, which is now being considered by that specialty board. So things are moving forward. Uh, it looks favorable. I, I can't say for sure, but uh, it's, uh, it does look very interesting, and we've come a long way, and I think uh, Dental special recognition for oral facial pain would be really helpful in getting more people in the field managing these patients. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Schaefer. <clears throat> uh, we're going to just quickly move on to, to Dr. Fox now. Uh, do you have slides? Uh, I do. I sent them in earlier. I think they're going to be displayed. Okay. Great. Yep. Can you hear me? I guess you can if you answered. Okay, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Dr. Wyatt, and thank you to the National Academy of Medicine, Health and Medicine Division and the committee for really um, tackling this uh, TMD uh, issue. I think what has become clear in today's webinar as well as um, the first uh, webinar is uh, we have a lot more questions than we have answers. So uh, I, I don't envy the committee in trying to pull all this uh, together into a, a final report, but it is very, very important obviously most particularly to the, uh, to the patients involved. If I can go to the, uh, the next slide. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the IDR, we're an individual membership-based association. We have uh, over 11,000 members worldwide. About 30% of those members are in our American uh, division, the American Association for Dental Research. And our mission is really to drive dental, oral, and craniofacial research for health and well-being worldwide with the vision of uh, oral health for the world through discovery and dissemination. 
I won't read all these in the interest of time, but our values center around scientific excellence, social responsibility, and the scientific community. Um, so if I can have the next uh, slide. And uh, I have just a very, very few number of slides here, but I really want to talk about from a research association's perspective. Um, IEDR has uh, 32 different scientific groups and networks. This is actually one of our uh, networks, which one of your committee members, uh, Dr. Richard Orbach, is going to be very familiar with, um, having been one of the founding uh, members of it. But this is our International Network for Orofacial Pain and Related Disorders methodology. It was originally formed back in 2006 as the RDC TMD uh, consortium for the research diagnostic criteria for temp temporal mandibular disorders. And in 2017, they uh, changed their name to this INFORM network, International Network for Oral Facial Pain and Related Disorders Methodology. This is a very important uh, group. Um, they've had, a, obviously, a number of publications over uh, the last uh, decade or so, and really very useful information for the practicing uh, uh, dentist. <coughs> they publish, obviously, in journals that are going to reach the practicing dentist. And just two important ones recently. Uh, one with uh, Dr. Schiffman in 2016 in JADA on the diagnostic criteria uh, for TMD for clinical and research applications, again, geared towards the uh, uh, practitioners. And actually, this month's cover story of JADA, uh, July uh, 2019 JADA, is on clinical predictors of persistent temporal mandibular uh, disorders. And they're really trying to um, tease out, and the, the graph on the right side of the slide is looking at um, as patients present um, with first onset of uh, TMD and then with follow-up examination for TMD persistent. What they're really trying to look at here are, is coming up with a predictive model to really understand that transition from, from acute uh, pain to more persistent uh, TMD. So I would encourage the committee uh, to read that paper in detail or have Dr. Uh, Orbach present that uh, in more detail. If I can have the next slide, please. The uh, IADR and ADR also um, co-own the uh, journal Dental Research. This is the uh, number one journal in the field publishing original research reports in dental, oral, and craniofacial research. And uh, just over the last um, three decades or so, we've had over 229 articles on specifically on TMD. So it doesn't even include that in oral facial uh, pain. Uh, but recently, our Editor-in-Chief Will Gianobli had a special issue on oral facial pain that was um, uh, published in September of 2016. Ron Dubner was the guest editor, and several of those articles are very highly cited over the last uh, several years. Uh, one by Dr. Gary Slade on uh, painful temporal mandibular disorder, a decade of discovery from the opera studies. And I will get to that in just a second. And another one by Richard Orbach and uh, uh, Dr. Sam Dorkin on the evolution of TMD diagnosis, uh, past, present, and future. So both of those are excellent articles among, as are the rest in that special oral facial pain uh, issue. And as has already been discussed earlier in this webinar, uh, the interrelationships between TMD and oral facial pain uh, in general. I can have the next slide. Uh, I do want to emphasize that uh, NIDCR is the largest federal funder of TMD research by far. Uh, the pie chart on the left side shows that um, uh, from 2008 to 2008. That's Jeffrey Kuster traveling on flight 1685 to Pittsburgh. This will serve as a general boarding announcement as we are going to start boarding. Somebody's at the airport. Uh, flight is about to board going to Pittsburgh. I don't know that could be. Anyway, uh, NIDCR funding about $154 million over this uh, decade period of time. And uh, some of the other two or three other institutes uh, funding a much smaller proportion of TMD research. And they're really funding the full breadth of research from basic research really trying to eliminate the cellular and molecular basis for chronic TMD and identifying potential uh, pharmacologic targets for prevention, pain management, or reversal. Uh, translational research studies, uh, whether that's in tissue engineering and regeneration, through the um, uh, Dr. C program, which is the Tissue Regeneration Consortium, uh, looking at novel devices for TMJ reconstruction, um, collaboration with another institute at uh, NIH, the NIBIB, on re uh, really trying to quantify bone changes uh, in the TMJ. Uh, clinical research, this is the OPERA study at the University of North Carolina, or OPERA Consortium, investing over $36 million over this uh, period of time, really trying to understand the TMD risk, TMD risk factors, 
including role of uh, uh, sex differences, genetics, and overlapping chronic pain conditions, which obviously is very important uh, in TMD research. And, and importantly, building the research capacity. So some of the investments in TMD research is looking at the pipeline of researchers in this area and various career development awards to really expand and strengthen uh, investigators uh, in this area. If I can have the next slide. Um, so some of the key advancements from uh, this decade of um, research investments from NIDCR is really trying to tease out the molecular signatures uh, of this acute to chronic pain transition. And that's really uh, very important, as has already been mentioned, it's, it's really the acute to chronic pain transition that we need to have a better understanding of. And they're looking at uh, various nerve cell surface proteins and receptors that can give that um, uh, signature of, of transition to chronic pain. Uh, there is a lower level of uh, anti-inflammatory uh, molecule, I'll mention one. And then uh, as a potential therapeutic target, looking at epidermal growth factor receptor. Uh, looking at sex differences and increased risk for women to transition to chronic TMD. Uh, it's interesting that the sex differences really come out when it's that transition from acute to chronic versus just the presenting uh, acute uh, TMD um, uh, presentation. And then obviously overlapping chronic uh, pain conditions. If I can have the next slide. We also looked at, and I should have mentioned at the beginning, I've got uh, uh, Dr. Shell Adjuboy here, who's our Director of Science uh, Policy, looking at, looked at the clinicaltrials.gov web, website to kind of see what clinical trials have happened uh, within the TMD space, and not very many, and not many, uh, even fewer, have been completed with results. Um, so the U.S.-based studies, 28 were completed. We were only able to identify eight with results, um, many more sort of unknown or withdrawn or not yet uh, recruiting, and the various interventions that they were looking at were either pharmacological, behavioral device, um, uh, or, or procedural. We're going to have the next slide. Uh, this is a, a NIDCR funded, the National Dental Practice-Based Research Network, which re is really a, a gem within NIDCR. They're now in the uh, third round of um, funding. Uh, these are seven-year studies, so now we're, uh, I guess, in year 15 of the national PBRN. The PI is uh, Dr. Greg Gilbert at the University of Alabama, uh, Birmingham. Uh, very broad-ranging research topics that they're looking at, but of, of the ones that are looked at TMD, they've done an analysis of uh, management of painful uh, TMD and identifying through some survey work, uh, treatment decisions, change in pain and function over time with different TMD pain treatments. It's a survey of practicing um, uh, dentists. Um, they're also doing a cohort study uh, right now looking at, um, looking at these treatment decisions and, uh, and what, what the response has been with the patients. Um, and, and importantly, this is a real, there's over five to 6,000 of these practices in the country, all over the um, uh, United States. And the dentists who actually treat patients with TMD, patients, uh, TMD uh, pain, they're only seeing about three patients a month. Um, and obviously that's really nowhere near enough to really develop any sort of expertise. So I think that's why some of the earlier discussions of the uh, oral facial pain and the, um, developing a specialty is so important uh, because uh, you are going to need that. And you compare that to, I think um, Dr. McCauley mentioned is the oral facial pain clinic at University of Michigan um, seeing about a thousand a year. So um, dentists that are seeing these, these patients aren't developing expertise. And in another survey um, with the National PBRN, this was actually in conjunction with the Japanese um, PBRN group, looked at the dentist distress in the management of chronic pain. So it does create anxiety amongst dentists on how to treat chronic pain. And I think that goes to uh, what Dr. Schaefer was presenting, that 95% of dentists would just assume rather uh, refer these uh, patients. So I can have the next slide. Um, we were also asked to address, you know, what are the opportunities for really improving dental practice research? Uh, we think getting more dental practitioners involved in the National Dental PBRN will be key um, in involving these dental offices with their consenting patients, obviously. Uh, involving dental patients and their patients uh, with a, across a wide geographic distribution across the U.S. in a variety of practice types and settings. Uh, data collected from practitioners about the decision-making and the treatment that they're performing. And then separately collecting data from the, about the outcomes from the patients uh, themselves, sort of separate from the dental office visit uh, collection of data. And there's really an opportunity, we think, to really develop a unique patient population hub. 
which then could be linked to practitioners who have the expertise in treating oral facial pain uh, TMD patients. I can have the uh, next slide, which is the second to the last slide. Uh, it doesn't fit precisely, but I think I'd be remiss if I did not mention the NIH EEL initiative. Uh, this was launched uh, last year in April 2018 to address the national opioid crisis. Um, this is a standing for the helping to end addiction long term, but as with all things in research investments, we're going to get knowledge out of these investments. It's going to have wide applications in different areas as well, in addition to the specific um, issue of opioid addict, uh, the opioid crisis that they're trying to address. And so we need to be uh, paying close attention to the research results that are becoming out of this HEAL initiative and some of the priorities in research uh, to engage pain management strategies is going to have applications within TMD understanding that the biologic underpinnings of the transition to chronic pain, uh, understanding those biologic mechanisms. And this is really part of an NIH common fund effort, uh, accelerating the discovery and preclinical development of non-addictive pain treatments, advancing new non-addictive pain treatments through uh, the clinical pipeline and establishing uh, best management strategies for the acute to chronic pain uh, conditions. And then kind of the next and final slide in terms of um, Opportunities for research and partnerships, you know, within the National Institute, National Institute of Health, the HEAL initiative that I just talked about uh, uh, presents a tremendous opportunity. I think applying some of the findings that have come out of a decade of investments with the OPERA studies, how do we take some of those findings and then apply it in, in the uh, in the PBRN, uh, PBRN setting? So it's more of a real life, uh, real world situation in the practicing community. And then obviously from that to the wider um, uh, dental practicing uh, community. Um, they're collecting data in the PBRNs on this, this prospective cohort study, and then how does that build into a, uh, in our, some RCT approaches to TMD uh, pain? We had an opportunity to touch base with uh, uh, Dr. Gilbert, and I think that's his, his highest hope within this area is to really have a champion to, um, uh, to have an RCT approach to uh, TMD. And then really, and also beyond NIH, and these are agencies that haven't really spent much uh, effort within uh, the TMD uh, space, uh, PCORI, looking at comparative effectiveness research to inform decision making for best uh, treatment outcomes. And then also within ARC, ARC funds the medical um, practice based research networks. And while there has been some communication between the ARC funded medical research, uh, medical uh, practice based research networks and the dental PBRN, you know, how do we increase that interaction and uh, touch on some of the, ba of the uh, issues that we're have been addressed already in terms of interprofessional education and interprofessional care and um, uh, collaboration, particularly as, you re as it relates to the TMD and the chronic pain condition. So there could be some opportunities there. Um, the National Guideline Clearinghouse, uh, while it's been uh, discontinued in search of a new host, I'm not exactly sure where that, that is at the moment, but I think what dentists are telling us in these surveys and their anxiety in treating these patients is that they need the guidelines uh, developed. So I think that's a real opportunity to have some TMD uh, treatment guidelines uh, developed. And then of course, also uh, with industry and federal uh, par partnerships. With that, I will close it and I look forward to the broader uh, discussion. So thank you, Dr. Wyatt. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Uh, and thank to everyone on the panel for, for the uh, very informative presentation. We now have roughly 20 minutes until our close at five to uh, have uh, just general discussion. So open it up to uh, any of the committee members. So this is Kata. I'd like to follow on and, and, and push Dr. Fox a little further on the whole issues of the medical uh, dental divide and the research uh, agenda that he uh, sort of proposed and how that can be lessened and what does he see from a, what, how does the American Association for Dental Research interconnect with um, MD research networks, or maybe you've got MDs as part of your network. Yeah, yeah thank you for that uh, question. That's a really an excellent question. And we do, in fact, have MD members of our association. Uh, much like the NIDCR, we, we like to think that we represent anybody that's interested in dental or on craniofacial research. So that would obviously include folks that are based in um, institutions beyond dental schools. And if you look at the extramural funding out of NIDCR, a little over half of their extramural funding is going outside of dental institutions. So those uh, 
researchers are part of our group uh, also, and that is a, a high priority for us in terms of our advocacy work to make sure that we're reaching um, those communities. Um, and I've been delighted to be on this uh, webinar and hearing about some of the uh, efforts at uh, UC Davis with Dr. Copenhauer, and I would hope that we can uh, continue those collaborations um, or discussions uh, rather going forward. And we do have, I mentioned we have 32 different scientific groups and networks, including this INFORM network, but we've got a neuroscience group, we've got a behavioral science, uh, epidemiologic and health services research group that draws in people from across um, uh, disciplines. And I think um, our annual meetings are opportunities to um, highlight those collaborations and um, push, as you, as you said, uh, forward those dental medical uh, collaborations on, from the research front. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I have yeah, a hi, this is, uh, this is Sean Mackey. I want to thank all of the speakers and want to direct this back to the early portion of the session today to the deans of the medical school, but also invite anybody else to weigh in. Um, Dr. Copenhaver did a nice job in presenting the uh, pain medicine approaches to trying to influence pain education within medical schools. Uh, I was part of the task force and an author on that paper he was alluding to. And the motivation for that was we recognized that the deans of medical schools operate rather independently and define the curriculum for each of the medical schools. And the thought was that if uh, better defining the board uh, coverage for pain management, uh, that we might be able to influence things at a national level uh, in ways that we haven't before. And I, I think the efforts of that uh, bore fruit and gave us a sense of both what is, but more importantly, what is not being covered in the USMLE exam. And I would ask the, the deans, is it an analogous situation with regard to the MBDE exam and do the deans pay much attention to that exam? In other words, if one were to find out that there is a lack of pain-related content on the MBDE and that were brought to light, would that be um, a source of influence to increase the curriculum around pain? So, you know, different schools put di different emphasis with regard to um, uh, how much um, they focus on the national dental boards. We do have national dental boards right now. Um, those boards are being um, changed. Uh, we traditionally had a part one, which mainly focused on basic sciences, and had a part two, which traditionally focused on clinical sciences, um, and now that's being combined. And the goal is to make the exam, I think, a lot more... Um, um, practical, um, really applying um, evidence, both basic science and clinical um, science, and making sure that students can integrate the, um, the two. Um, I can tell you that from, from Rutgers' perspective, we do pay attention to what's on the national board um, um, exams. We want to make sure that our students are uh, prepared um, um, for them, but it doesn't drive our entire, um, our entire curriculum. This is uh, Lori McCauley. I think you know, I would hazard to guess that the amount of time in our curriculum on pain across the U.S. that would uh, translate into a national board is probably not the area we could use the most exposure, especially relative to TMD. My guess, and this is speculation, that it's more associated with clinical experiences. And I think that ties directly to the uh, conversation that we've been having about the programs in oral facial pain that could help to increase that exposure as well as the uh, reimbursement for patient care so that patients can be seen and the educational experiences along with those would be uh, uh, more appropriately directed. This is uh, uh, Phil again. You know, one of the you know the, the the schools that are kind of represented here are ones that are active in the TMD um, arena, 
I mean, other 12 programs, that means that there's about 50-plus schools that um, um, don't have um, programs in that particular area. Um, you know, a potential model to, to look at is that in the digital arena, um, there, were, there was the, um, the uh, Prosthodontic Association that got together and they created a really high-quality digital curriculum um, in that arena. And then what they did is they partnered schools that are further along in the digital dentistry arena with those that don't have that kind of um, expertise to try to move other schools um, along. And I think that's been a pretty successful model. Um, and so one of the things that we need to think about is how do we move schools that don't have TMD programs within their school, how do we move them forward in this, uh, in this area? Thank you for bringing that up because that's, that was why I brought up the MBDE with the hope that maybe there was something analogous to the medical school USMLE. Um, because I'm mindful that the people who are on the call, the deans are representing, if you will, centers of excellence that are already doing this, but at least according to the almighty source of information, Wikipedia, there's 66 dental schools in this country. And I'm assuming that not the other 63 are not perhaps operating at the same level that you are. So how does one influence things at a national level? How, what, what are those touch points? And I, and I got the message that, well, one money is always a touch point, getting better reimbursements. Um, I'm just, we're just looking for, for any way of influencing this. I mean, I happen to, to think that the most effective way to influence what's in the curriculum is information coming back from practitioners with regard to what, uh, what patients are demanding in terms of services. Um, you know, I don't think that, that putting a few questions with regard to oral facial pain is going to make a huge difference with regard to what dental schools do. But if they're talking to their alumni, which we all do do, um, and they're hearing that, you know, that TMD is an area where they're, they don't feel comfortable, they don't feel well-trained, they're not quite sure where to, to refer their patients from, that kind of feedback could be pretty influential on a school. I think, is this, this is Jeff Schaefer. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, good. Yeah, so I just would say that the, the key, I think, is accreditation standards. If you want to change what dental schools do, you know, change the accreditation standards. I mean, the, the recent change uh, where they, uh, we had a standard that, that had to have to, imp they have to consider the impact of prescribing practices in substance use disorder made, student, made schools put that in their curriculum. So if we could change the accreditation standards to say that TMD must be taught at a certain level, they'll do it. And then that's, that's immediate. And then, you know, the, as far as raising the standard of oral facial pain care in the, in the community, that really has to do with people being taught to recognize the problem and then how to manage it. But also they have to be able to make money doing it. And I think, you know, this, hopefully the special recognition would move forward and getting some, some coding standards where people can get paid to, to manage these patients. But, I, you know, if dentists can get paid to do it and they know they have the, the problem, they, they have some basic uh, education on how to identify those problems, how to manage them, then I think we'll, we'll make inroads in, and handling the access to care problem. Yeah, th this is Dave Copenhaver. I, I think one of the things that we, we see cha that's a challenge in the cancer center and many cancer centers across the country is that, yeah, it's, it is access to just dental care. We, we've seen like where there's uh, individuals that will have um, exposure to chemotherapy, change the pH in the mouth, and they won't have dental, act, dental care, but yet there will be carve-outs in their managed Medicaid products for uh, the medical care, their oncologic care. And this goes to also surgical procedures in the head and neck, which then can result in TMD or atypical facial pain, facial pain disorders. Um, so in the process of forwarding bundled payments for a thought of looking at value-based care for what is the outcome we're trying to achieve, both with surgery, chemotherapy, and uh, great care in, in, at the end result, does incorporate the dental component and oral facial component, pain component to the care. So this episode, the whole episode is bundled under um, these multiple different practices. And I think the, the next push for CMS when looking at certain archetypal patterns might be that there be um, 
an oral facial component, pain component, to looking at head and neck surgery as part of the bundle. Um, it would be nice. Uh, and it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting problem. No, that is, yeah. yeah good comment. This, this is Penny, <clears throat> Penny Cowan, um, and and I guess I wonder, as I'm listening to all this and access to care and paying for the treatment, I mean, I see that in the same world of of just pain and pain management. And it, and I guess I'm concerned about, you know, the number of people with TMD. What's what's the cost? Are they going to educate them? And are are the big facilities actually going to, once they establish them, if they don't make money, are they going to disappear? I mean, I see that over again, over and over again in pain. And while this is only one of the components of pain, I've seen how difficult it is to get pain education into medical schools. So I'm hopeful that this will happen, but I guess I'm just a little leery of the hurdles that may have to, you may have to go over to actually accomplish that. Well, Penny, no, let me also uh, add that a lot of the patients feel that, you know, this TMD, is uh, has a systemic basis in that it's not being recognized and referred properly. So right. maybe right. that's also in this hopper. Right, and I and not, but I understand all that. But I mean, that stuff plays into the whole pain issue that that people are facing today and access to care. So I just, I mean, I'm hopeful, but I just, I still, I guess I'm just concerned. That's all. No, no, that's that's a legitimate concern. I think looking to where the money is going to be spent and the, you know, which you know which department does oral facial pain fall into in a hospital, you know, who wants it, and uh, sometimes it's it's difficult for people to say, okay, this is a a discipline that we can make money on and and help sustain our department. So there are definitely economic considerations and and deciding you know whether you're going to be managing oral facial pain patients in your facility. It's a real concern. This is Bob Wine again. Um, given what I'm hearing, um, which is, you know, everything we understand about this is it's multidisciplinary nature, it's perhaps systemic links. Is it a reasonable goal to, to feel that we would train general practicing dentists after a four year curriculum to be competent to manage TMD, or is that simply not reasonable nor appropriate that they should be at understanding? and how to maybe triage patients, but it should be a referral process at that point. Well, I think, you know, we at, at Harvard Dental School are, are teaching uh, a certain standard of TMD therapy. We want our students to be able to recognize whether someone has a TMD problem and, you know, what's the basic diagnosis, whether it's muscle or joint and whether they have neuropathic pain. I think, I think that's a standard that we, we have to teach to, and I think, the, you know, we have to prepare our students to to be able to manage the patients that are going to be in their chair. And if, and with, if we don't teach them TMD, we're not doing that. So that's just a standard that has to be done. And I think, you know, if we can get um, that standard in, in the general practice realm, then I think the patients that don't do well, um, you know, that, that 10% of patients that aren't going to do well, or 20%, then, then hopefully we'll have a better chance of, of having facilities, you know, oral facial pain, um, um, specialists that can can help manage that smaller population. Okay, thank you. This is Dave Copenhaver. I, I think that that dovetails nicely on pain management largely and the primary care workforce is that we've seen that general practitioners in this case uh, becoming adept at treating pain and pain specialists or even the, the specialty practices helping to educate and uplift the current workforce. Not only does it allow increased access out in rural populations, urban underserved locations, but it improves the referral process. So I, I, I think that there is that segue to understanding how to not compartmentalize education, but to, to be more liberal and it's, you know, uh, dispersing it in that way. Very good. This is Phil yeah. Holman. I, I totally agree with the, the comments that were just, just made, but I think we do need to look at, you know, what we expect right now of our students to be competent in by the time they finish their four-year DMD curriculum, um, and whether or not everything that we want to do is realistic within those four years. Um, no, it's, that's, that's a tough call. You're right. There's so much they have to know, especially as, as each, you know, dental especially progresses. Um, 
you know, there's more and more that they have to know. Well, we run into the same thing with orthodontics and implants, other things that just take a lot more time than we have available in the four-year curriculum to train yeah. new companies. And, and what goes so back to making students do a GPR, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, which is not a bad play. So we have about two minutes left. We could do one more question, I guess. Anybody have anything that... Hearing none, then uh, I will thank our speakers again for these very important uh, presentations. They were very um, informative. Uh, all of the presentations will be posted on the website for referral later. And if any of the um, uh, members or anyone has additional input, uh, input, the committee welcomes those anytime through our process of preparing our report. So thank you all and uh, appreciate your efforts. And uh, with that, we'll close the, uh, the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye now. Wonderful.